So I'm now recording and just to reiterate, um, I've acknowledged the traditional custodians of this land, acknowledged their connection to, to land, to waters and to fungi and, and paid my respects to members past and present as we always do. So thank you and welcome all for coming. Um, so we're sh now sharing the meeting uh, and recording it. So if you're all aware of that and um, if you could all type your, your questions in the chat bar and we'll get to those at the end as well too. So. Great, and um, I'll hand over to Diana Lima now. Thanks, Wayne. And oh. hello. Thanks, Wayne, and hello to everybody out there in Zoom land. Can you hear me? I don't know. Testing. 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 Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now, everybody? Can you not hear me? <laughs> Get your phones out and zoom in. <laughs> Okay, I'll try and um, hit both audiences. Uh, okay, so I'll like to take you on and explain a little bit about the things I've been involved in the last 21 years and take you into another group of really fascinating fungi, the entomopathogenic fungi. If I can drive this. Okay, entomopathogenic fungi, literally the fungi that cause disease. So the pathogenic just means disease causing, ento means insects. But really more broadly, we talk about the fungi that cause diseases to the arthropods. Insects are part of the arthropod group, but we tend to, um, but they're fungi that cause diseases to insects, spiders, mites, ticks, etc. But whenever I talk about insects in the rest of the presentation, I'm more broadly meaning arthropods. It's just easier to say insect than arthropod. Everyone okay at that? But the entomopathogenic fungi are actually part of any healthy ecosystem. Um, they're quietly causing diseases in arthropods out there, contributing towards the population control of those insects. Ready? Excellent. Thanks. No. Sorry, another. Okay, right, so the antipathogenic, some of those pathogens are what we call obligate pathogens. They are also called biotrophic. So these um, can only grow in an insect host. Other ones are facultative pathogens, which means they're um, also called the scientific term for that is hemibiotrophic. And that means that they can also grow as saprophytes. Now these two distinctions are actually quite interesting and important when we actually want to use these fungi for biocontrol. Um, so the biotrophs can actually sporulate from the living body of their hosts. Okay, well the hemibiotrophs have to um, kill their host before the spore production can happen. So the nightmare is if you've got sporulation happening and you're still alive. Okay, so it's great for us, not great for insects. Okay, the ability to invade and kill insects is actually appears to have arisen independently. In the, and repeatedly in many different fungal lineages through fungal evolution. Um, the entomopathogenic fungi occur throughout the fungal kingdom in several taxonomic groups. They comprise a wide range of morphologically and ecologically diverse fungal species. They occur in five of the eight fungal phyla, and they also occur in the oomycetes, which um, if, although now known to be phylogenetically distinct, they used to be, they're ecologically similar, and the oomycetes used to be counted as fungi, but now we know they're just something, nothing more than bleached out algae. But I'll include them for this discussion. Okay. Now, I've put out here, and hopefully everybody can see the screen. We're missing a little bit at the top here, Wayne. I've put my scheme, scheme and there are going to be taxonomists who don't disagree with me because they always disagree. but. I've come up with this schematic for eight different phyla of fungi based on the most recent textbooks and papers I've read. And even then I'm still confused, but 
to show you where the entomopathogenic fungi sit, we've got the higher fungi, the ones with septate hyphae, the dicaria, and we have the um, ascomycetes, with ascus means the sac, they're the sac fungi because the Latin for sac is ascus. We have the basidium mycota, the club fungi, because um, basidium is um, Latin for um, club. And then we have the lower fungi, these fungi that don't have septate um, hyphae, um, and they're usually the less well known, but we have the zygomycota, we have the glomeromycota, which are the uh, vascular mycorrhizals, we have the zoosporic fungi, which used to be one phylum, but now have been split into three, the tritiomycota, the neocalamastigomycota, the blastocladiomycota, and then we have the microsporidia. The microsporidia were once known as um, protozoans, but now with the genetics molecular type work, we know that they're actually fungi that have lost the ability to live outside of a cell. So they're intracellular parasites. And then of course, we've got our oomycota. So the next slide, we'll, we'll now see that where the entomopathogenic fungi occur, they occur in the basidia uh, ascomycota, basidia mycota, zygomycota, the blastocladiomycota, microspridia, and the oomycota. So I'll go through and talk a little bit about some of the characteristics and why I've put in, you know, about some of each of those, and then we'll come to talk a little bit about the ones which we probably know a lot more about. Okay, so the entom um, entomopathogenic fungi, can we get rid of that? <laughs> so, <laughs> everyone here can't. Okay, so they, they've learned to infect and interact with a wide range of insects hosts in various ecosystems. So. We find entomopathogenic fungi infecting from aquatic insect larvae and out to the adult insects in aquatic systems, in freshwater systems, insects in high canopies in tropical forests, right down to even in deserts. Wherever there are insects, you'll find, or arthropods, you'll find there'll be a fungus that can actually infect them. Um, they also infect all developmental stages. Okay, so for one, any one insect though, it may only hit one stage but you will find fungi that can um, infect eggs, larvae, pupae, and adult and nymph adults, uh, insects. Such, so you can think with such an assortment of niches has resulted in the parasites involving, um, evolving considerable morphological diversity and resulting in enormous biodiversity. And of course, the majority of which remains unknown, but that's pretty much for all groups of fungi that you study, anything you study, you think that uh, what is unknown is probably much greater than what we actually know. And the best study groups of entomopathogenic fungi are the Ascomycete hypercreales group and the Zygomycete entomopheriales. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that in detail. And there's a bit of eye candy at the bottom of that slide for people who like seeing dead insects infected with fungi, like I do. They bring a lot of joy to my heart when I see those. Okay, so the mode of action um, for any of the, the, for all of the entomopathogenic fungi, no matter what phyla they're from, they all must start off with a spore germinating on an insect cuticle um, under the right conditions. So usually we need the right conditions of temperature and humidity are the primary drivers, but, but that insect cuticle could actually be cuticle on the outside of some insects, but it also could be the cuticle lining the inside of the buccal cavity where it's nice and moist. And some can actually also do enter through the gut, but most don't. It's believed the gut too low in oxygen, too high in carbon dioxide, and the environment may have the wrong pH, too hostile. But as you'll see, there are some pathogens I'll talk about later that actually specifically enter through the insect gut. Okay, so once they've germinated, they invade through the insect cuticle into the body cavity. And they'll do that, and this is a slide here, that they do a very similar way to plant pathogens. Plant pathogens usually have a spore, which will germinate on the surface of a plant, and then they produce a specialised structure called an apressorium. An apressorium usually tends to be a group of cells that's produced that then produce enzymes necessary to soften whatever the fungus needs to penetrate through, but also give it mechanical purchase to push through. So once it can push through, and so imagine the insect cuticle is going to have some waxes, so it needs lipases for that. It's going to have some, um, it's going to need some um, cellulases, it's going to need some proteases. There's a whole series of things that it needs. Once they get through, um, they usually will form a, 
penetration plug and then they'll form some secondary hyphal bodies. And then when they get into the cavity of the insect, they, in some, this is where they do differ because some fungi then produce a yeast-like stage, a blastospore. Some produce protoplasts, which don't have any, um, any cell wall around them. And others, um, some of the lower fungi just stay in a hyphal form. So there is a fair bit of variation of what happens once they get inside. Um, and there's a, I suppose, a picture of a um, spores germinating on the surface of a cattle tick. That's from my PhD work. Um, so I, the upper story actually a bit hard. I don't know why I chose that slide. I've got better ones to show the upper story, but let's move on. Okay, so the insect death, um, once the fungus in there, can often occur through physical damage because they've actually wrecked, they've grown through, they produce a lot of proteases and they've actually eaten through the muscles, they've eaten through the organs and they've completely disrupted. And in some cases, they also produce toxins. And some, sometimes it's both um, toxins and physical damage. And other times it's um, some people, some researchers will say it's the toxins being produced, but some of the toxins we believe are there to protect the insect once the fungus has grown through it, because it's like keeping the insects and nothing else can have it once the fungus has grown right through it, and that makes sense. Um, but so the insect body in many cases then becomes complete, completely consumed by the fungus. So what might look like a caterpillar has now become all fungal material. So it's now become a hard wad of fungal material, but it's still got the shape of a caterpillar or whatever. Um, so if you look inside and cut them up, you'll see it's all fungal tissue. It's no longer insect tissue. And this is where the term mummy comes from. They, we say they become mummified. And at this stage, it's a big difference between something killed by bacteria and something killed by fungi, because the fungi normally makes something go hard and firm because it's full of fungal tissue, whereas bacterial cells usually make it all squishy and smelly and disgusting. So much easier, better to study antimopathogenic fungi than antimopathogenic bacteria, I say. Okay, so how does the fungus then um, transmit to new um, hosts to find new hosts that can produce asexual spores or sexual spores? The asexual spores, like any asexual spores, often a, that's a strategy of fungus uses to be able to produce a lot of spores in a hurry to make the most of a food source. So asexual can be produced rapidly, multiplied up with lots and lots of spores. Um, and that also has consequences for biological control. I'll talk about that the, uh, later on in the talk. But the sexual spores are often produced when you're going to over um, go through, when you've been through a resting period, like it might be colder weather, drier weather, something like that. So, but that's not always necessarily the rule, okay? But that's sometimes the way it is. Okay, so now I'll get on to some of the examples. So we have the oomycota, the poor old bleached out algae that used to be fungi and got demoted. Um, the infections there, we, we talk about them because they occur in aquatic freshwater environments. It could be bubbling streams, it could even be water that's held up in, you know, bromeliad in a rainforest or something like that. But the oomycota have important pathogens of 12 different genera of mosquitoes. And because they are pathogens of mosquitoes, they've actually been studied for a long time with their potential for biological control. And a well-studied facultative par parasite of mosquito larvae is the Lagen Lag Lagenidium giganteum. Okay, so that's why we, we talk about that group. Um, and the interesting thing is it's also we started being a facultative means you can you have a capacity to produce the spores or produce some kind of reproductive material that's not in the actual host. It gives you more flexibility. Okay, the microsporidia. So this group that's more recently been elevated and allowed to join the fungal kingdom. So they contain a very important group of intracellular B pathogens. So this is the um, Nesema serrati and Nesema apis. Um, and these infect honeybees. Now they have they affect the gut, the bee gut, causing diarrhea. So these um, fungi actually go into the intracellular. So they have to go inside and the inside the gut cells. And what shall happen, um, they actually can be responsible for quite serious losses in the beekeeping industry. Um, and what happens is because the bees have got diarrhea and they become lethargic, you'll get um, bees bee defecating at the entrance to a hive and in a hive. Now that's completely opposite what happens in a hive. Bees are fastidious in their hygiene normally and the spores will, spell, um, will spread. But 
Nesema has seems to be an important um, pathogen when bees are under stress. The stress could be pesticides, it could be starvation. And there was one theory that it was one of the major players that was causing the colony collapse disorder in America. That it wasn't just, it was just several things, but it could be well possible that you could believe the Nesema will come in when the bees are highly stressed. Um, but we don't have colony collapse disorder in Australia for a number of reasons. Our beekeeping industry is a lot healthier, except for bushfire and drought. Okay, so then we have the Blaster Cladiomycota. Now these were previously, some books, you'll actually see them still called the Tridiomycota, but under the taxonomic scheme that I'm using, so I'm defending myself there, there's three groups within Tridiomycota. But this group are also interesting because they're aquatic fungi and they, affect, they infect dipterans and mosquitoes are dipterans. So, but they're also parasites of nematodes, midges, crustaceans, even other Blaster clads. And they can grow on pollen, keratin, cellulose, chitin. So they've certainly got a diverse range of enzymes there. They, they can eat, almost, they're omnivores, I guess you'd call them. They can eat anything. Um, but most in the gene are coelomomyces. Um, and these infect humans that uh, infect mosquitoes that affect human diseases. So that's why they uh, have been studied, why they're interesting. But please note the name coelomomyces is a genus name, but you might also hear about coelomyces which, or coelomyces, which is a group of fungi, okay? So this is the genus coelomomyces, a slightly different name. Um, but one of the problems that would make them a hard buyer control is they have an alternate host. They have to do part of their lifestyle, uh, life cycle in a copepod, a crustacean in the water. So that would knock them out as being good buyer controls to actually use, for us to use. Uh, all that we could do is promote the environment for them to live in, to use them. Okay, so now we move up a little bit to um, more um, structured lower fungi, the zygomycota. And the zygomycota have a very big group in them, the Entomophorales. And the Entomophorales are actually one of the most important groups of insect pathogens. And they're one of the ones that have been known and studied for the longest. And we have our in-house expert in um, QMS because David Holdham did his PhD on this group. They're an interesting group. They cause epizootics, um, which kill large numbers of insects in, under forests and crops under the right conditions. It's known that um, some crops people have aphids infecting them, but when you get the right conditions, you can actually have natural epizootics, which I guess is the insect form of an end epidemic or a pandemic for insects. Um, then they will kill off a whole lot of the aphids in those yeah, um, crops. Try not to make noise. They're, noise. they're biotrophs, so it's they can good, consume your host reception. when they're still alive. So there's no growth in the insect cells once they're dead. And that makes them very difficult to use as biological control agents because the only way you can produce them is on living insects. And that is really labour intensive. But countries with very low labour costs have actually been trying to do it. Um, and what's interesting with the zygomycota is in most cases, the spores are forcibly discharged in the environment with the exception of massospora, which has um, the spores released passively. And so the other interesting thing about the um, entom entomophorales is they eject their spore and it might be what we call a primary conidium. And if that hits a surface on an insect like a wing or maybe on a glass surface that so can't germinate, that spore can then eject a secondary spore. So it gets a second bite at the cherry. And some of you thought to eject a third spore, a tertiary spore. So it gets two bites or three bites of the cherry. So, um, so and, they, and again, there's some really interesting stories in this group because they're very well studied and they certainly are pretty weird what they do. But um, so in addition to Massospora, um, other groups like strong wellsia, which infects Delia, the cabbage flies, um, and certain species of Entomophaga, Arinia, Entomophora produce spores before the host's death or in the living body. So Entomophora, and, and, and we're finding more and more that you know they, they can alter the behaviour of the insects. So we're gonna, I'm going to talk about zombie ants a bit further on. But this group also are pretty good at entering, altering the behaviour of the insects. And it's only in recent times that people are starting to try and get a handle on how they're doing this. And that story, those stories are really fascinating. But um, so one of our really well-known ones, Entomophora musci, and that Entomophora musci, that the Latin, that the Latin for saying destroyer of flies. So how'd you like to have a name? I mean, this is a fungus that must strut around with a name like that. 
Um, anyway, entomophora can we know it alters the insect behavior because what it will do is like the zombie, ant, it causes the insect at the end of the day to climb to the highest point. Um, sorry, it could be early morning. I don't, it, it causes it at um, the time when it's the highest moisture levels to climb to as high a point as it can. It then produces a little droplet of liquid that sticks its mouth onto either the leaf blade or the leaf stem or the gla or the whatever it's gone onto, and that glues it there. Next thing, the fungus starts coming out from the abdomen, as you can see, and shooting its spores out. And some people early on used to see these um, fly spots inside a house. They'd see a, a fly up on the a window. And so all these little white spots around it, and that's actually these spores which have been shot out. So the idea under the natural conditions is to sort of shoot spores out from a high grass blade and which can be rained on and distributed either caught by breeze or down onto other insects. And at a time of day, the optimal time of day for the conditions for the spores to be produced and and germinate. So, you know, you've got to give it to fungi, haven't you? Hey? But then we get into Massospora, and this one's really amazing. Massospora cardinia is this one um, also produces spores while the host is alive, but it has passive. So what happens? Imagine, you know, it infects cicadas. Imagine you're a cicada. You've spent 17 years in the ground as a larva, right? And as you come out, you get a couple of spores of this mass of spora stuck on you because you've been wiggling your way out to become the beautiful cicada to have your life above ground in the elm tree flying around. And then you, the spore, you get, catch these spores, they start to germinate and grow inside you. So for the next couple of weeks, the fungus continues to grow inside the cicada until it actually packs out the abdomen, making the abdomen burst and the abdomen basically falls off. So all you've got then is this massive spores being shed from the back end of this fly, which is still at this cicada, so which is still flying around, which is still alive. So this cicada can still fly around and happily as anything, if they can be happy spreading these spores. So one of the people who's been studying, Professor Matt Cassons, is actually, he named them flying salt shakers of death because it means that those spores are being spread to other cicadas. But no, wait, there's more. Not only that, but what these cicada, this fungus also does is it somehow makes the, my, the males hyperactive sexually. So it makes them hypersexual. They just want to mate. They don't have any genitals left because they've all dropped off, right? But they they driven this mating behaviour. They even do these wing flits, which make them appear like females attracting males. So the unsuspected males come and try and mate with this thing that's got all these spores, which is just going to be death to it. So how does that happen? I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. Okay, so that's uh, Zyga mycota, and if that, they aren't pretty horrible for insects. We have the Basidio mycota. Okay, this is the group which most people who go on forays are going to be uh, aware of because most of the macrofungi belong to this group. We don't have a lot of entomopathogenic fungi in this group. We have a couple of interesting ones. We have Septobasidium and um, Eurydnella in the order Septobasidioles, um, and they exclusively feed on scale insects. Um, scale, sorry, scale insects. So we have Eurydnella. talking all this time and no one else can hear me out there. <laughs> this is a, just a technical check up then. Um, Eurydnella attack single scale insects and Septibacidium attack whole colonies of scale insects um, with as many as 250 insects infected by one fungus. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that one, but another group, the Athelia, um, which that's the sexual state and is asexual state is Fibula rhizoctonia. It produces sclerotia look like termite balls and what happens is the termites think they are termite eggs and they look after them and so they're taking over it's a cuckoo nest syndrome so they can take over the termite nest with all these termite balls which are actually the fungal spores so go figure you couldn't dream this up if you tried Okay, so the Septobacidium are also interesting, and the way I like to highlight this one is because if you're out on forays, it's quite possible that you're going to have seen this structure on, on branches, the, the, the structure of the Septobacidium, which you can see here. Now, what 
that is, is that's the fungal covering. The fungus actually produces like a house that covers and houses a whole colony of scale insects. And so even though it's a pathogenesis, it's a two-way thing. So you'll have a whole colony of scale insects which are all protected by this fungus, but in return, the fungus will feed on some of those scale insects. So some of them become the slaves to the fungus. And so the scale insects are there and they're all got their little proboscis um, into the starlets, down into the phloem and the tree in the plant and they're sucking out the juices and living off that. But the fungus then comes along and it's produced this great big complex mass of hyphae that produced this protective house for all the, um, the scale insects, but somehow a few of them have to give up a lot of their nutrition to the fungus. So it's pretty amazing. So next time you see one of those, when you're out foraying, look up on a branch and see them. Okay, now we get to the Ascomycota. Now these are the really exciting ones. This is probably the Rolls Royce of the entomopathogenic fungi category, okay? Um, so they're a diverse phylum that comprises many entomopathogenic fungi. So we've got some less species um, orders like Pleosporales, Morangiales, Ascospheriales, and then we have the hyperdiverse Hypercreales. And Hypercreales is where it's all happening and where most of you have probably heard of cordyceps and Ophiocordyceps. So the hypercreales contain many of the well-known insect pathogens, but in each case, because we're talking, these are the hemibiotropes, they're facultative pathogens, the insect dies before the fungus begins to produce spores, unlike those, you know, those barbaric lower fungi that fruit while they produce spores while they're still alive. So after killing the host, the group are able to colonise the insect cadaver or the body, switching to a saprophytic nutrition to maintain their hyphal growth after the host insects. This is where they can well and truly make a nice tight little mummy with continuing to grow saprophytically. Um, okay, so just mention these other, the, the not so diverse, and then we'll talk a little bit about the others. So in the order Pleosporales, the entomopathogenic species, um, there you have Podonectria, and they infect scale insects and have a very distinctive bright coloration and fleshiness. I think they're actually more easily seen in rainforests, under leaves and on leaves where you find. I don't think they're as common in your dry type of forest that we have down here. And then you have the um, Morangiales, include a number of species also associated with scale insects on plants. And in this case, the entomopathogenic species exhibit this perennial growth for several years, rather like the Septipacidium type of thing. Um, or at least until the scale infested branch dies. So maybe you get a, they're parasitizing the scales, but the scales are parasitizing the leaf. And then maybe, you know, there's decreased nutrition from what it's doing to the plant. And that's when the whole lot fall over and die. And then we get the Ascospherulales. They can um, contain some really, in this group, we have the Ascospherula, which are really important pathogens of bees, okay, both solitary and, colon and colonial bees, social bees. They create, they cause a disease called chalk brood and chalk brood is the bane of the existence of people, some beekeepers. So there are some beekeepers who tell me it's the worst problem in Australia. Other people say, no, that's not the worst. There's American fowl brood and small hive brood and other things, but chalk brood is certainly serious. And again, they're not sure whether it's a nutrition thing, but it seems to sometimes be uh, more common when their bees are on certain types of floral sources. So. Okay, so what happens is um, the infection occurs when the larvae ingest the fungal spores. So the, the larvae are being fed by nurse bees. So the nurse bees are either picking up the spores if the hive is already contaminated with the Ascospheria spores. It's picking them up and they're feeding them accidentally to the larvae. So those spores, like, unlike all the other Ascomycete and entomopathogenic fungi, they will germinate, they need to germinate in low oxygen and high carbon dioxide. You can't grow them easily quite so easy just to get them growing. But they also can grow quite comfortably at 34 degrees, which is the temperature inside the brood chamber in a beehive. Whereas most of the other Ascomyces, they like more environmental ambient around about 25 to 20. You know, when you get above 30, they don't grow very well, which suits me when I work with them because I don't like anything that grows at my body temperature. Um, anyway, so the fungus then grows into the, the body and it grows pretty quickly in these bee larvae and killing them and it creates a mummy because it, it, the whole larva becomes totally mummified. And 
if you have brood affected, you'll see little white things, but often a good hygienic hive will actually clear them out and throw these mummies out. So sometimes you'll come to a beehive and see all these little white mummies on the ground, but you'll also see dark mummies as well. And what they are is where the fungus is actually sporulated. And this is again where Ascospheria is really weird because um, it's not like the other Ascomycetes that produce assy Ascospores in a little sac and Ascus, usually four to eight spores in Ascus that's then contained within Ascocarp. These are different. They just produce a spore cyst which is a single and large cell containing all the um, ascospores. So it's just got this big ball of ascospores. That, that's what the black is on the outside of these mummies. But what's also interesting about these spores is they have a curious similarity to the appearance of pollen grains, which is something. So again, go figure. Okay, so then I've got the other, um, let's get into the hypercreales because this is where it's really interesting. So. Some of the most diverse and most interesting ones all um, are in the clavet, the hypercreales. So we've got our three families in that. You've got the, the cordycipitaceae, the ophiocordycipitaceae, and the um, clavicipitaceae. And what's really interesting is because particularly clavicipitaceae has plant pathogens and it has fungal pathogens and it has insect pathogens. So that this is where, I mean, Nigel Hill-Jones is, um, speculated along with others, they put out a paper with quite a few years ago now, where they're thinking that there could have been a plant pathogen origin to some of these pathogens, insect pathogens in the Clavicipitaceae where they jumped across. And we also know that in there, the, cordycep, um, the cordyceps fungi or the all related, the, the, there's some really interesting compounds, get secondary metabolite compounds get produced. But when you think about Clavicipitaceae, that's where the ergot fungi are which are known to have, you know, a whole pharmacopoeia of interesting compounds that do some really weird stuff. And so we find when you start looking at some of these um, insect fungi, they also have some pretty weird compounds too. Um, anyway, some of the most well-known important genera, we have cordyceps, we have ophiocordyceps, we have tulipocladium, um, and then we have my two favourite fungi, Metarizium and Bovaria. Um, I'll explain a bit later. But then, then we have Hypercreella, Terubiella, Hosatella, Aminostilbe, and Acanthomyces. Acanthomyces tend to like spiders. They make spiders look beautiful with all these funny structures growing out of them. So, and some genera are notable for their diversity and abundance in the tropical forest worldwide, where you won't get them even further south. And this is like Hypercreella, which is Ashesonia in the asexual state. And noting that we're doing one name, one fungus. So these names have been merged and sometimes they've taken on the asexual name and sometimes the sexual name. So that's why I'm still, because if you want to look up any of this, you'll need to know the old name because sometimes you'll find it in the old name. But they're known to infect white flies and scale insects in tropical forests, but then through few of these species of the hypercreella are found in the more temperate zones, you know, or the subtropics. And the other thing is sometimes they, you know, these groups can cause epizootics under the right conditions, but you need to get the right conditions, environmental conditions. So there's a buffalo fly, the things that cause problem in cattle, infected with metarizium, and a macadamia weevil infected with bovaria. And they do look beautiful in their green and white coats, respectively. So the genus Op Ophiocordyceps. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about all of these because other than saying if you really want to look up the interesting stuff, the ascomycetes, what most is written about. Um, but there's so many good videos on YouTube now. David Attenborough is um, one of his series. There's an absolutely brilliant one showing the ophiocordyceps unilateralis with the ants. I can't compete with that one. All I can do is talk a little bit about it. So I recommend, I'm just hoping this is giving you a taste for starting to Google a little bit about entomopathogenic fungi and find out more because they really are amazing. They, they show where fungi can be incredible. Um, anyway, so Ophiocordyceps has become really um, well known because it's, they attack ants and you can get these huge infestations in small areas which are called graveyards. And of course, if you don't already know the story, I mean, Professor David Hughes, who was at Penn State University, which is one of his um, key areas that he did research, and he termed, I think he coined the term zombie ant, I think. Um, but so what you have with the ophiocordyceps, you have the ants running around on the ground and they'll get infected. But 
it's interesting that if the ants are in a nest, they don't tend to go through the zombie ant thing because as they start to get sick, the other ants can detect it and they flick them out. They clean them out. So it's when the ants are down on the forest floor, when they might be out foraging, they start to get sick. Obviously, I don't know whether they get a headache or what happens. But the fungus is taking over their body and it makes them climb up to a height that's optimum for temperature and humidity for the fungus. The ant climbs up and the last thing it does is it clamps its jaws down on, well, in this case, the mid vein of the leaf. I believe there's differences between species in terms of where they clamp their jaws down. And what's interesting is David Hughes did a bit of a study and he looked at fossils and found that this fungus has been around for a long time because they found the bites on the mid veins of fossilized leaves. He's able to find. So it's been there for quite a few million years, a hundred million years, hundreds of million years. So anyway, so the zombie ant, um, the, the Ophio cordyceps unilateralis, so it clamps down and the fungus grows out through the, leaf, the feet, um, secures it to the leaf, and then eventually you get the, um, the cordyceps-like structure that we know, that, that sort of, um, what do you call it, like a little aerial coming out. In this case, it's got a swelling in the middle with a parathesia uh, embedded in it, and then the ascospores can be shot out, rain down on a few more insects. Um, unsuspecting ants down below. And so David Hughes has got this big group who is studying how is this happening. He's really interested in the mechanism. And they've um, found that the fungus actually doesn't take over the brain, but it completely surrounds the brain. And they've come to say that it's like the, fun the ant becomes a prisoner in its own body. It becomes a prisoner of the fungus. And the ant is still there, like the brain is still there. It's like it's still the driver but the fungus is behind the wheel. And but they're still doing some more investigations. And all of this takes a huge long time, we can imagine, to untangle and, and tease it out. So it's it's a fascinating story. I'm not sure. We'll talk about that at the end. Okay. Okay. Okay, so what can we learn from antipathogenic fungi? So there's another. So it's interesting for I mean for antipathogenic fungi have been people have been trying to use them as biological control since the end of the, the 19th century. Okay, so and it was the, the, yeah, the end of the 19th century. So it was only um, during the 20th century with the advent of the you know a lot of pesticides that they stopped using fungi because they're just too difficult compared to the you know take a take a chemical and can throw it around. But then at the end of the 20th century, you realize, well, we've got a bit of a Faustian deal going on here with all our pesticides. We need to look for softer options and so more research. So a lot of research has actually gone into understanding the whole invasion process, but it's more the physical thing. It's really only been the last, I think, 10, 15 years that a lot of attention has turned to, well, what's the, what's what's affecting the behaviour? How are they doing that? Because we're actually starting to get really interested in some of these fungal compounds. And so if you think about the work that um, David Hughes has done, I mean, he hasn't started to, un I don't think he's started to untangle the chemicals. I think they're doing that, but it's it's amazing just knowing where the fungus is growing and what it's doing. But the Massospora, there's um, Matt Klassen's group, who found some really fascinating things because they've actually, so this is the remember the cicada, it's lost its backside, it's flying around, it's dripping spores, it's all hyper, hypersexual where it's sort of brandies anything, attacking everything it can find or getting getting others to attack it. So what what's driving that behaviour? I mean, if you've lost half your, a third of your body, I mean, you, we wouldn't be too happy. But what he has isolated, he's actually isolated psilocybin. So it's a hallucinogenic compound. And it, this is the first time they found it outside of a mushroom. So that shocked them. So they went back and confirmed it. But not only that, but they found a compound called cathinone, which is an amphetamine. So now they're trying to figure out, well, what's the role? Well, well I actually say there's one more that Pfizer could be interested in. So <laughs> what makes them so super randy? <laughs> So, but, but anyway, so we've got to ask these questions. So, so this is a whole new phase of antipathogenic fungi of what's driving the behaviour. And, you know, is it just the way, are they taking over brains or are they producing these incredible compounds? So anyway, so that's, that's the whole, you know, I think there's, there's going to be a lot more research coming out of that. And there's probably many more fascinating stories. But the thing that we um, probably can, you know, we've, 
the fungi offer us, the entomopathogenic fungi offer us a low chemical option for food production through fungal biocontrol. And mostly it's inundative where you take the spores, produce the spores up, and you formulate them in a carrier, it could be an oil, it could be some other kind of adjuvant, and you spray it onto insect pests the way you would do a chemical insecticide. But the difference is you've got a biological, you haven't got a chemical. And the biological, the fungus tends to be more narrow in its scope. It also doesn't tend to hang around in the environment for years afterwards because it's a biological. The spores will last for a certain period of time in the environment and then they'll, they'll die. So, um, and we're mainly using ascomycete pathogens as suitable because it needs to be something that's facultative and it needs to be so if we need to be able to grow it on a non-living source because it's a lot cheaper and we need to be able to produce masses of spores. And there are a number of products registered overseas and they're most commonly used are metarism in Bovaria. And we actually have a compa a a product in Australia that's been on the market for about 20 years called Green Guard that's using metarism um, arachnid. Um, sorry, I've just forgotten the species name. I should know it really well, but I'll move on because I'll, I'm having a brain freeze. Um, anyway, so the Green Guard is very, um, it's been a very successful product for using on locusts. And particularly when you're aerial spraying across areas where you don't really want chemicals raining, raining down. So that takes you to a little bit, you know, going into the work I've been doing. So the hypercreales, we've got the sexual state, which are beautiful to look at, fantastic, but they're not suitable for biocontrol because you can't produce vast numbers of spores with these. The purpose of their sexual spore is not for a massive, um, not for reproduction to produce huge numbers of spores to increase your population. But if you go to the asexual state of some of those ophicortocipitale, uh, ophicort of a cortocipitaceae and the cortocipitaceae for the Bavaria and the um, metarism. So here we've got Bavaria, which is also called the white muscadine disease, but you can see the spores, um, it's just covered in spores. They produce massive numbers of spores. That was called muscadine meaning bonbon. So like little lollies or something, French lollies, but that's where the name came from. So they produce massive number of spores and they they will also produce those spores on a non-insect host. You can grow them on rice, barley, oats. And then of course you've got metarhizium, which is the same. It's very powdery um, from masses of spores on insects and you can produce them easily. So my work in the last 21 years, I've just I retired from, has been looking at how we can use these to target um, insect pests. And I've just, quickly show a couple, I did a lot of work on cattle tick. That's a really good, um, cattle tick are a major problem because the ticks seem to find every chemical that they throw at it, they seem to develop resistance. Um, ticks are pretty, pretty horrible. They're a major problem in this part of Queensland up to the north and out to the tick line in the, the west. They not only cause um, hemophilia, you know, because they can anemia in cattle, but they do vector a lot of um, parasites which will kill cattle. So it's a really serious economic problem. Anyway, the work I did, um, we were killing ticks in the lab really brilliantly, but actually making it work on cattle because we didn't seem to, the coat in the coat of the cattle didn't seem to be moist enough and cool enough for the spores to germinate and well, they could germinate, but they didn't have long enough at the right temperature and humidity to to destroy those ticks before they went to the next stage and then fed up and dropped off. Um, maybe someone might be able to take it further, but it was certainly in the lab, it's pretty spectacular. Um, then I looked at sheep lice, now sheep lice. Um, sheep are, lice are a major problem in sheep because you don't see them. They're only a couple of millimetres long. They're in the fleece, but we, um, the fleece actually provides a really good microclimate for the fungus because wool is an incredible insulator. And because it's moist in that environment and it insulates the temperature, it turned out, I didn't think it was when I first started work, but anyway, so um, the, the need to have a non-chemical is probably pretty important for the jetting of sheep because if the dipping failed, then you can have high numbers of lice. And if you treat it with a chemical, that's, and a lot of them are pretty nasty to humans that they've had to use. And that means that the shearers have been exposed to a lot of pesticide in the fleece of the sheep. So we did do a little mini dipping thing and we did jetting and it also involved lots and lots of lice counting. 
You have to count lice in 40 10 centimetre parts all over the sheep to estimate the lice population. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Ola. Never have to, I'll never have to count another lice, I hope. Um, anyway, but what we did find was really amazing that this is um, fleece on the left hand side, fleece that hadn't been treated, and the lice actually strip all the grease off the wool. That means the wool's no longer water repellent. Um, it makes them itchy, they bite at their fleece. And then her treated fleece is beautiful and white. But anyway, um, that work, I don't know where it will go um, because it hasn't been funded further. And to register it re requires a lot of expense and expertise. The other thing we I spent, we did a couple of very major projects. I spent many years going out to cattle feedlots out in the Brisbane Valley. Um, you have lots and lots of cattle standing around all day with their mates eating food. You're going to have lots and lots of manure being produced and flies love manure and where the cattle stand you won't get flies but where you do as the manure gets pushed out you get lots and lots of flies. Flies are really irritating to the cattle and they're irritating to workers, they're irritating to people who live nearby to feedlots but they also have the capacity to spread disease. So chemicals aren't really a good option here because these cattle and feedlots are usually the last 56 days of their life and you don't want chemicals that are going to have withholding periods whatever so we um, came up with a fungus, we took metarhizium, we formulated an oil, we did, um, the one thing about flies is they don't rest, they only seem to go to the animal, animal to get moisture and they get into their food bunks and eat the carbohydrates in there, but they then spend a lot of time in vegetation and we believe it's a sort of territorial in that they go back to the same places. So we found we could spray the vegetation with this fungus. So the first time I did it, I formulated and did an um, aqueous where we did it in fairly high volume spraying the vegetation, but then we used to have to go around and net the flies, take them back to the lab to see if they'd become infected. Um, we also did lots of trapping because you've got to try and measure what your effect on the fly population is. So it was a lot of measuring. And after the first three years, another project, we stepped up to changing our formulation to make it very economic. And I um, was using only three litres of formulation to do an entire cattle feedlot, which is quite large. This is an aerial of the cattle feedlot and the blue areas where we sprayed and we actually got a really good result. We showed we were actually dropped the fly population down. Massive amount of work to prove that, but it's still up to my department, my ex-department and the meat and livestock if they want to commercialise that. I haven't heard anything. Um, current project that's now, um, I was involved in getting started, but it's now my successor, a young guy called Stephen Rice, who's an expert on Mealworm, so lesser mealworm, wherever you've got birds, you're going to have this darkling beetle, lesser mealworm. They produce massive, you know, the, you just get the ground of a chicken shed, whether it's your backyard shed or a commercial one, can be crawling with these larvae. They, birds try to eat them, but it's not good because they do vector pathogens. They also, the adults can destroy any insulation buildings. So again, you don't really want chemicals in these environments. So um, Steve came up with a great formulation that can be put down with a simple um, fertilizer spreader. And um, yeah, and again, we had some great results. And currently he's trying a few different, he's got a new project looking at different um, types of chicken sheds with concrete floors, etc. And hopefully he'll, when he wraps that one at the end of the year, he'll, the funding body will maybe try and start getting that one registered and take that one further. So hopefully some something's come out of my many years in the department. So the, where are we going in the biocontrol in the future? I think um, it's an option. It, it sort of went dead for a little while. There was a lot of work about 20 years ago, but now there's a resurgence of interest. There's a big group in Victoria who I, I consult with um, who are now starting to look at it for fruit fly control um, among quite a few other pathogens, uh, pest insects. So the use of fungal pathogens is actually a really simple principle because that's what they're doing out there in nature. Um, it's, but the practical application is quite difficult and the jump, the, everything, you know, you give me an insect um, and some fungus in the lab, I can probably kill it if I throw enough at it and stress it. But doing, getting a practical formulation that then a producer, a, a farmer is, can use, they're not going to go and change all the way they do things. They're actually going to do it the same way they would have used chemicals. So, um, and getting a targeting the right stage of insect and the right timing, that's where all the science comes in. There's been some good success stories around the world, but I think there's a huge potential for more. And I think there is going to be an imperative for safe and sustainable pest control increase. I mean, for a start, 
we've now got an agriculture production system in Australia where we're having increasing amounts of um, healthy foods being planted, such as almonds. How many people don't drink cow's milk? They prefer almond milk. Avocados, macadamia nuts, macadamia oil, all of those things are seen as healthy, but all of those crops and blueberries, high antioxidants, they all need pollination to get a yield. If you don't have um, any insects put onto your almonds, you get no yield. So the only insect that you really can manage in large numbers to achieve that is actually the honeybee currently. And of course, if you're using chemicals, the problem is you're going to kill off your honeybees. So there is an imperative for low. Um, but where do we go on that? I mean, the, and also the consumers are wanting, they're more aware of the long-term effects of chemicals. So I think consumers want that, but we haven't got there with political or legislative support. At the moment, to register a biopesticide, it's the same cost and difficulty as registering chemical. And the cost is just massive, the amount of testing you have to do. And because the legislators follow their legislation, which assumes it's the same as a chemical. So, um, but it requires committed research and a range of expertise, and hopefully there's still a future there. But I think entomopathogenic fungi, they're not only uh, fascinating to read about, to discover, and to amazing to look at, but they also have a practical role in our future, both in sustainable life as well. So it's a bit of eye candy if there's any questions. How are we going to manage the questions? Okay. Okay, do you want my, mine first, then I'll take We'll take yours first. Yeah, if everyone heard that, but Wayne's house is when you have fungi that can control the behaviour of insects, such as those causing summit disease or zombie ants, um, does this suggest fungi are sentient creatures? I don't think I'm the person to answer that. I don't think I can. It's a deep, difficult question. But I, what I do think, I mean, I've been working with fungi, studying them since I first started my first subject in 1975, I think it was. And they never ceased me to, to, cease to amaze me because we've only just scratched the surface because they really, we, we say the forgotten kingdom, the hidden kingdom, but it's more than that. I mean, they have a lifestyle which is different to anything we understand. I don't think we comprehend them yet. We've, I don't think we've even started to comprehend fungi in how they work. They, they work collaboratively. They're plastic organisms. They're plastic in morphology, ecological role. They're, more plastic in their reproductive roles. So I don't know, and I couldn't answer that question, but I think, watch this space, because I think they're the most fascinating form of life on this planet. And maybe they do control the planet. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you're... Question is that okay? Um, person could see great opportunity in biocontrol and IPM. Um, people like Bayer uh, interested in other using gene splicing, etc. Um, yeah, there is huge potential. There is IPM, but the big companies aren't jumping in and putting money in. We've been to them. We've talked to them. They're aware. Um, actually. It was um, one of them, I better not say who it is. We, we actually had a company set up probably 30 years in Australia to produce metallurgium based products and they registered the Green Guard and they registered. That company was then bought out by an American company who wanted that production facility. And I think the person who set the company up was the real microbiologist who understood it, but he didn't have the opportunity to stay as a partner. The American model was push him up. 
But that company still held true and was interested and I used to work with them. And they produced a lot of the fungi for me to test out in the field. Um, but then they got bought out by one of the biggies. And the biggies have actually dropped because it's not economic. They're, you know, they've got bean counters sitting in offices somewhere. It's all about profit. It's all about whatever. And I think biological control is still at this stage for a smaller industry. And it's more suitable for people who, under, you have to understand, it, it's simple to do, but it's not simple. Cottage labs, because to grow it is not that difficult. It's not rocket science, but you do need to understand the fungus. You need to be able to think like a fungus, like me. Um, so, and, and so if you're a cottage industry, you can't afford to register them because APVMA, Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicine Authority, that's where you have to register anything that's going to go on any food crop or on any animals. And they and that, that's where I said we don't have the political or the legislative environment at the moment. So we're a long way from that. I, you know, 21 years I found a bit frustrating. Yeah, yeah. So do we have more? Yes. Any more questions? Oh. I, I do terrible things to the insects you love, Vivi. <laughs> yeah, the, how, the question is how specific are the entomopathogens? Again, it depends on the entomopathogen. If you take metarism in Bovaria, some metarisms are quite general. You can kill several different, you know, across quite a few different groups of fungi. Bovarias, again, um, but sometimes, Bovarias I've found in my experience to be a little bit more narrow in their host range. But then you might find that you've got one strain of Bovaria that will actually hit your target better. And that's why we do a lot of strain selection. But when you get down to the entom entomopherales, often you've got great specificity there. So you do. And, and I guess when you're thinking about the sexual state with the, off um, the Ophiocordyceps, some of them are really specific for ant species. So there's specificity, but there's when you look at the asexual states of Metarisium and Bovaria and even Osaria, they're not as specific. But they're still less damaging. Um, they're not as broadly damaging as the chemicals are because you haven't got the residual, the residues around, you don't get them hanging around. And you tend to have to, like you, can, you don't have as much collateral damage for the, um, the non-target beneficials because of the way that you've designed your system to hit a specific stage, and the way you've applied, the, it's the way you apply, the way you formulate and apply your fungus can actually narrow down um, a, a metarism that might actually be inclined to hit quite a few different insects. But then if you've got quite a few different targets that your metarism will hit, that's actually a good commercial trait if you're trying to register something because you're registering one fungus and you don't have to keep going through the costs all the time. So you, so I believe the, you can get your specificity by the way that you formulate and apply to actually you know, minimize the uh, collateral damage to your, your um, non-target beneficials. Um, are there, I gave the examples of the ones on scale. Are there other examples for ones which will hit merely buzz? Um, I would say yes. I'd have to go and look that up because I don't have that specific information. Um, I'm pretty certain there would be. Uh, but remember, I'm not an entomologist or I'm not an insect pathologist. I'm a mycologist who loves killing insects. <laughs> Slowly, in the most bizarre ways. Sorry, Vivian, I have to keep apologising. <laughs> Oh, okay. I just wonder what the difference between the higher and lower order fungi, please. Okay. The
the higher fungi are different physiologically um, and morphologically. They're, they're hyphae for a start. The higher fungi have hyphae which are septate and that allows them um, and they're they allow them to build and they anastomose easily, which means they join together. So those the higher fungi actually can form 3D structures more easily they, than the lower fungi. So you think that that's where the basidiomycetes produce these large fruiting bodies, the astomycetes produce. So so being able to produce 3D structures comes with that, um, of that. But there's a lot more I could go into. There's, there's a whole series of different. So I guess the best thing I can liken is we all know that in the animal world, we have vertebrates, the higher animals, and we have invertebrates. And the difference between invertebrate and a vertebrate is quite different. Invertebrates have got their skeleton on the outside, their digestive system and neural systems are back the front compared to the vertebrates. So invertebrate, um, so the lower fungi, it's a, it's a sort of a, it's a difference on that kind of magnitude. So the lower fungi don't have, um, they don't have the same type of septation, they um, they can grow more rapidly. So if you notice that you might get a pin mold like rhizopus on your bread in the fridge or out in the you know in your bread thing, it's there one day. It's, sorry, it's not there one day. It's there the next day, and the whole thing's covered. Or you um, you also get rhizopus on your strawberries. Now your higher fungi don't grow at that rate because they're producing septa. They've got a different structure in their height. In their hyphae, it takes longer to grow. The lower fungi can grow much faster. They produce different enzymes. There's, there's quite a few other differences, but I think hopefully that answers the question. If I you compare to invertebrates and vertebrates. It is. It was when the lower fungi contained the oomycota. They have cellulose, but now we've kicked them out. I'm pretty certain it's chitons in their cell wall, yeah. But there will be a lot of differences in terms of the the very you know, the, the mixture of compounds and everything in the cell wall. So, um, Okay, somebody who just said, I have a Bovaria species that kills off the stink bug on my citrus tree, but it kills them too late in the season. How do you get fungi to do its job at the right time? Million dollar question. Well, I suppose, I mean, if you grew them up, if you could isolate the fungus and grow it up and have the fungal spores there to apply, but the reason that it's killing them off too late in the season, I suppose, is the stink bugs have to be there first to start picking up. It's a bit, you know, it's got to build up its population. And then by the time the fungus has built up enough sporulation on the dead stink bugs to infect some new ones to make a difference so that you see it, um, it's it's at the end of the season anyway. It's a bit like parasitoids. There, yeah, there's a time lag to build up. That population, I suppose, and that's why I suppose by control, you, your intervention is you come in and you find the fungus, you isolate it, and you grow it up in pure culture, so you're ready to hit it at the early part of the season before it naturally builds up in the environment. Does that answer the question? Okay. Okay. I think they're all. Can I take this device off my head now? <laughs> I'm trying to be COVID safe, so. Um, Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Diana, for that for that fantastic talk. So um, that was really, really terrific. Always wonderful to hear you talk. Um, so great knowledge, and thank you, everyone. Um, so it's now uh, quarter to eight. So uh, I do have a couple of things to speak about in addition to Diana's talk. And I guess one thing was that we did have a <clears throat> We did have a fungal foray recently down at uh, Mount Cordeaux, and that was an excellent foray. So, um, 
So what I'm going to do is probably just share a, pic, a few pictures with, uh, with not only you, but um, those online of the things we found. And um, hopefully, um, so I'm just going to share my screen so if everyone can share. I just want to reiterate too that um, we, we did have an incident at the, the Mount Cordo foray, and that sounds serious, but it wasn't really that serious. But um, just in terms of workplace health and safety, we do take your personal safety very carefully. So I send out a document prior to forays, which is a workplace health and safety document. And it's about 20 pages long, and I try to make it fun and full of images, but it really covers important facts like the presence of stinging trees and basically what the risks are that we face in the field and how to avoid them. Um, and one of the risks in the field that we did face that weekend and we failed to properly avoid was uh, scrubbage. So normally before we arrive, and um, we were all very careful, and I got everyone to spray their boots with metho so that we're not bringing any fungal pathogens to site. Um, so that was awkward and well. And we did all the workplace health and safety. Now, normally I ask people to, to spray with DEET. And the reason we spray with DEET is to avoid tick strike, but it also keeps away things like scrub itch. Um, now, when I arrived on site, I forgot to bring my spray and I thought, oh, it's all right. We're up here in the mountains. So I didn't spray and I had nice full coverage on. I had long pants and long sleeve shirt. I had a full brim hat, all of the things you need to have in place. So I didn't spray with DEET and we went around on the foray and I was all over the ground on my knees and sitting on things. Anyway, so come Saturday and Sunday, I'm kind of getting a bit itchy and I'm realizing that, oh no, I've got these nasty big insect bites all over my body. So Sunday night, I'm in living itchy hell and I'm like, oh, here we go. I've got scrub itch and that's what happens. So don't spray with DEET and some people have an aversion to it because it's a strong chemical and we recommend the 40% strength. But if you don't spray with DEET, then you'll be dealing with scrub itch. And as ever, I remind people that the prevention is better than the treatment because Sunday night I was sitting in a hot path, trying to drown them all under my skin and then hopping out. And this is the prescribed treatment. And then after you get the out of the hot bath and you've dealt with the really horrible itch and you shouldn't scratch it all, then you have to wait for your skin to cool down. And after my skin cooled down, I painted myself with the paintbrush with the scabiol because you treat it like scabies. So if you didn't have a scabiol ready, you're in a world of pain. So after painting myself with the scabiol, I then consumed a quantity of antihistamines to alleviate the itch. And I kind of had to work from home the next day so that I could sporadically jump into the hot shower to alleviate the itch throughout the day. So just a reminder, workplace health and safety, get that DEET out and spray yourself thoroughly before a foray. It's also a good um, trigger to then go home and have a shower after the foray to spray the chemical off. And that's a good opportunity to check yourself for ticks. So just a reminder there to everyone for your workplace health and safety. So I'm just going to share my screen now. And here are some of the images from the foray on the weekend. So this was, I think, Vivian, you identified this little beetle. What was it, a pea? A pea beetle? Sorry? Meal bug. Peel bug. Oh, this great, great little peel bug. Um, uh, and, and anyway, so we initially we saw some lovely marasmus as well too. So I'll try and do these in order, but of course um, it's hard to do when the computer's a bit out of whack. So um, here we go. So here was a, the great a great turnout for the foray. So as you know, with national parks, we are limited to 15 people. So um, we, we really do need to respect that limit. So I had a great turnout for the day and that was all of us. Um, so three of us, I think in the end, three of us got scrub itch. So again, please um, check yourself. Some lovely beetles on the foray. Uh, and this is the little critter that um, curled up in the little ball as soon as we touched him and turned into a little pea, which we thought was interesting. So that was very nice. Um, and just a beautiful array of fungi on the, on the day. So this was a really good, a good day because um, and it was terrific because Kalula was an epic disappointment in terms of fungi. I think Patrick Lennon said he'd never seen so few fungi on foray before, but this was really a brilliant day out. Um, and all sorts of critters as well too. So if we take our, our blinkers off, we actually bump into a lot of other in, insect and, and small animal worlds. So it was a really beautiful day out. 
some lovely hema uh, marasmus and i think that's hematocephalus so france the resident marasmus expert and she's confirmed that so that was um early on in the foray and we recorded that one so it was a beautiful specimen don't forget that if you're seeing marasmus too you've got to get that undershot to record the number of gills and we want a sense of scale and the full specimen as well too so that's why we get the underside and that was the environment they were in so not a bad thing to do too if you're making a collection step back take a picture of the habitat rather than make a judgment call by saying i think it's wet sclerophyll i think it's this i think it's that just take a shot of the habitat because i'm hopeless in my habitat and i know sometimes habitats too are not black and white i always think that you know it doesn't there's not a clear line where the rainforest stops and the sclerophyll starts so there are these things called ecotones, which I don't understand. So take a shot of where you are. And then we saw these things, which we didn't collect because there were only a few of them. Um, if I had to guess, I'd say they might've been lack area. It has a small annulus, so I don't know, as ever we're, we're wringing our hands with what we find. Some beautiful bolides were there on the day as well too. Uh, really lovely. So we only found that one and we left it behind, but we found some more later on. So we did collect them. Number two is this specimen, um, and that was Philoporus. Philoporus are lovely, and I think it's important to get a shot of the mycelium too, so you can see the colour of the mycelium. And we actually did a little cut to see how they bruise. And that bruise we determined was actually the colour of, um, it was an olive black. So there's the Philoporus with its beautiful, which is actually a bowl leaf. A gilt bowl, just to make things confusing. So that was a lovely, uh, and as you can see, I, I took the colour chart out and I compared it to the, and it was olive black, olivaceous black was the the colour of the the um, the bruising. Interesting, that's the colour of the spore print as well too. You wouldn't think that olive olive black spores would come out of something with yellow gills, but they do. And that was it, olivaceous black, and that's the colour of the spore print. Strangely enough, so. Mind-boggling. And this one garnered some interest from Fran Gard because we think it might be a Marasmus. Now, it probably, in my mind, approximates most Marasmus elegance, but it's mysteriously lacking the hairy feet that I would normally associate with Marasmus elegance, but it has that lovely sort of gradation of colour on the stipe. And again, the, watch this space. So Fran's got the specimen tonight. I've handed it to her. And uh, it was carefully dried at 35 degrees Celsius, which is the recommendation. And um, she's going to work on that. And as you can see on top of those caps, there's white spores. So it's white spore, which I think is in keeping with Marasmus. So watch this space, but it doesn't have that typical color of Marasmus elegans on the cap either. So fingers crossed, we might've found something new and exciting for add for another feather to brand to add to her cap, hopefully. So wonderful, really. And that's it in situ as well too. Blink and you'd miss it because it looks very much like the leaf litter in which it was growing. <clears throat> Great specimen. And that I think was an Udomanciella. Uh, we, call, we call them Udomanciella gigaspora here, but I think that's actually an overseas name, is that right? So it's probably Udomanciella af gigaspora. And um, I, I didn't get the photo there, but they actually have a taproot, which I think I took a photo of later on. Um, and then of course we found the, the ubiquitous uh, Coprinellus disseminatus. These usually occur in large numbers. And they're really beautiful to photograph from underneath if you're a photographer and you don't want to do too much disturbance, then you can maybe twist that log just slightly and um, have a look at the underside. And it's always a beautiful shot, really picturesque. And then of course we found a rustula, but Patrick wasn't there, so we couldn't hand it to him. But I think he'll be doing a little happy dance once he knows we collected uh, a rustula because that's his field of expertise. Um, and it was a nice one. It's probably a run of the mill common rustula that you can identify by sight once you know it, but um, I didn't know what it was. And these were interesting from the top. We we're wondering gills or pores, but when we turned them over, we found gills. And my initial instinct, of course, is it has the look of either rustula or lactarius. Now, the two ways to, dis to distinguish between rustula and lactarius are, of course, is that lactarius lactates, and that's what these were doing. The other tricky way is to put a UV light on them because apparently rustula fluoresce and lactarius do not. Now it's hard to see that in the daytime, but in the nighttime you'll see that rustula will actually light up and give you a bit of a bing under a UV light, whereas lactarius don't. So we did cut it and we tasted the lactate milk, which is what you do for a diagnosis of lactarius. And uh, the milk uh, was immediately spicy. 
and about 60 seconds later that that spicy taste disappeared so that was really interesting and they were lovely big specimens i thought and they were in good fresh condition so good collection there um, a few other things what i would call uh, maybe crepidotus we really need sapphire to be on board for the fan and bracket fungi because she is the expert now crepidotus has brown spores however and i don't really see any brown dirtiness in the spores so I'm thinking crepidotis, but I would also think that needs to be worked on maybe something else. Um, and this one here, which I would say maybe is Pleurotus, Pleurotus ostriata, and I think Vivian's been working with those. So she confirmed the field ID, um, made a collection of those. Now this one's one we could we have two lookalikes for. Uh, one of them is um, so you think it's Hymenokaii. Hi, um, Yeah, that's the underneath side, so it's smooth and leathery. Yeah. Now, what is the other one, the Cetoporus? There's another one with a species name of Cetoporus, but Cetoporus is not smooth on the underside like this one. So I think this might be Hi, or I'm not sure. But the other one has a species name of Cetoporus, but it has visible spores or pores in the underneath side. And that's the top side, and both of them have that top, that brownie hirsute sort of look on the top. Um, and then, of course, is Udomanciella, which I thought was Mucata, um, but someone was telling me that Mucata has an, an annulus, and this one didn't. And it was very sticky and really quite big and meaty, so we made a collection of that. And this, of course, Cyclomyces setoporus. So I'm sorry, I'll go back to that one. So the two we mix is one is Cyclomyces setoporus, but Cyclomyces setoporus has pores on the underneath, and this one was smooth, so it's not Cyclomyces setoporus. So that's that. Okay, and then the Udimanciella. Um, now I guess when you initially see this one, you probably think it's either maybe Xylaria, because it has that kind of club look to it um, but because it's kind of high up and on the tree I knew straight away that maybe it wasn't that it was possibly Daldinia uh, even Daldinia concentrica but the way to find out if it is of course is to make a dissection and straight away you'll see those concentric circles inside it so that would be Daldinia concentrica um, which is King Edward's cupcakes or something like that I forget the colloquial name but that's something silly of so we made a good collection of that. Incidentally, they're really hard to dry because they're so thick. So I actually lost the specimen to um, mold. Never mind, we got a confirmation on the idea. A beautiful resupinate fungus with some lovely shelving. So we might go back up to Matt and see what he has to say about that. Um, so that was a nice collection and all over a log. And um, these are the bowl eats that we had saw before, but we suddenly found some more, so we're able to start collecting them. And of course, with bowl eats, as you know, you make a dissection to observe if there's any bruising, and there was none. So a lovely collection of bolids there. And this is what we would probably call Gymnopilus. Gymnopilus has that orangey sort of hue and that woody sort of stipe, and always on hard dead wood. Um, always seen Gymnopilus on a pylon. That's how I remember the name, because there's Gymnopus as well too, which is a very similar name. So Gymnopus, no pylon, Gymnopilus on a pylon. Um, and then we found that specimen, but we didn't collect it because that's all there was, of course. So naturally with the collection, you need a good amount of material and uh, all in good condition. So with only three specimens, it's sort of not enough for scientific scrutiny. And we also found some lovely, um, a lovely <laughs> caterpillar, which was very interesting. And there's a close up of the Philoporus gills. And there you can see the, the cross venation between the gills, which is kind of the remnants of the bolete pores, I believe. So you look for that cross venation, and on the left there, you can even see a bit of that bruising from where it's been touched. That bruising takes a while, takes about 60 seconds to occur. And um, this is what I would call Potocypha, maybe Potocypha petaloides. It's very thin, like paper, and has a, like a crepe, crepe appearance to it. Um, and there was a big log across the river, and as you can see, there were these Udomanciella on top of the log. So really lovely, uh, great day out, and really beautiful. And they just sat happily above us, and looking down on our little world. That was some Ceratiomyxa fruticulosa, a slime mold that we saw. 
we didn't collect it, we just recorded it because we could observe it to species in the field. So we just will put that on uh, iNaturalist later on when we get a chance. And a few other things. These are what I would call Tetrapergos uh, negripes. Tetrapergos negripes. Now, the way I recognize Tetrapergos negripes is they have that characteristic sugar coated licorice stick of a stipe. So I don't know if you can see it, but if I zoom into that stipe, you'll see it's like a little a licorice stick that's been coated in sugar and it fades up to pale. I'm sorry. So that's it there. You get that kind of licorice stick, licorice stalk. <laughs> so that was that. So as Fran said, um, you really do need to look at under the microscope and under the microscope, you'll find out why it's called tetrapergos because it has tetrahedral spores. So I'm not sure if anyone's as old as I am and grew up in the 80s where you had the orange tet packs, the orange tetrahedral, orange juice packs. Anyway, they look like those. They're very interesting spores if you can find them. And there's another shot there. So the licorice stalks give you the put you on the right track and then you confirm it with microscopy. Tetrapergos nigripes. So good amount of them, some snails. We found some um, Amaroderma rude. Uh, it's hard to see here, but there's the cap. They're a bit old, the specimens. And you can see here one of the cap and the stipe and it's blackened a bit. So I just put my big old finger on the underside of that one just to confirm that it was Amaroderma rude because they bruise immediately red, as you'll see from that fingerprint there. And then that fingerprint turns black in a minute or two. So Amaroderma rude. Okay, so Matt was Matt Barrett, who's a polypore expert, has provided feedback about the, the use of the term, the genus Amaroderma, and the fact that we probably using Sanguinoderma now here in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, Fran was relaying to us that that's nice because Sanguinoderma uh, implies a red color. Sanguine means red in, in Latin. Blood, it means. Um, okay, so that was some more pictures. Some, of course, Somatoderma elegans, which was uh, a lovely species to see in the field. You can identify the species, so straight away you can upload that to iNaturalist and put a dot on the Atlas of Living Australia. And then of course this beautiful tiny little um, stinkhorn, uh, which we all got a bit excited about. And I tagged Vanessa online and she instantly gave me very important instructions about the way, whether or not there was an opening at the end. And as you can see, there is. So this is the importance of really good photos. She said, is there an open at the end? So the answer is yes. And then the other question she asked me was, how does it attach here? Is it smooth or is there a, a collar? So as you can see, there's a little collar there. So this is a really important. Can you see that? <laughs> All right. You'll have to watch the video later on. <laughs> So that was that was it, uh, really, and it had a little egg there too. So we made a collection, and there's a close-up of it as well too, with the open end and the collared attachment, and um, and there's the there it is, and you'll see that the little eggs are, are dissected. Interestingly enough, you could I could have taken the eggs home and probably hatched them. If you do find them, stick horns, you can take the eggs, put them in a little box uh, with some moisture, and they'll just happily hatch out themselves, which is maybe a fun project for school kids to do too, if you doing something like that. Uh, and they, you quite often find them in gardens. So there's a fun project for people. Um, so beautiful. And here is some auricularia, what I would call auricularia delicata, beautiful looking thing and an edible uh, in the field. So they were lovely to photograph. And then I just took a photo of that because that was some, some of the mycelium from one of the dead um, fungal fruiting bodies. So I don't know if the mycelium is is that or something attacking it, but I thought it was just a nice picture of some mycelium spreading out in circular fashion. And there's a close-up shot of the Udaman, it's yellow. You can see it was a very sticky top. 
Budimansilla exanulata is the suggestion from Fran Gard. I thought mucata because I don't only know two Budimansillas and I thought one's sticky and one's tall with a root. Okay, so the exanulata could be the with means without an annulus, and that could be the correction to the field ID. That's from Fran Gard. And some Clavaria as well, too, in the field, which was beautiful. So great to see a, a, a great diversity of, of different morpho, morpho groups. Stink horns, coral, fungi, um, you know, mushroom caps, bowl eats, a whole range of stuff. And this is what I would call Lenzites. And Lenzites have those fantastic, what you would call bifurcate gills. So the gills go along and then they, they split out. So beautiful bifurcate gills on the Lenzites. And that's the top of it there as well, too. It's easy to get mesmerized by the underside and forget to take a picture of the top side, but that's important information. So Marasmia is elegans, but the only ones we saw, so we didn't take a collection, unfortunately. Um, and I didn't get a shot of the feet either to demonstrate. They normally have a little hairy tuft at the foot. But you can see how they look similar to those other Marasmias, but elegans have that characteristic orange cap. Cymatoderma elegans again, and of course we saw some Herisium. No one took it home to eat because it's a national park. And we didn't make a collection either, but we observed it. it was about six feet up a tree either, so we really had to zoom in and try and have a look at it. We couldn't get a good close-up of it. Now, interestingly enough, we saw two of these yellow fungi, yellow cup fungi. So these were the first ones. And I thought, oh, probably Pleurotus, I would think. Pluteus, I beg your pardon. Pluteus, thank you, Fran. I would think Pluteus because Pluteus normally have pink spores, free gills, and Pluteus like really old dead growth wood. So you normally find Pluteus on big old dead logs. So dead old growth and free gills and pink spores is how I think I'll start at Pluteus. So it mostly ticks most of those boxes. It kind of has free gills here. There's a bit of a gap around the stipe but I can't see the pinkish hue that I would normally see with a Pluteus. I normally see a pinkish hue to the, to the gills. So I kind of reserved my decision. Interestingly enough, we came across a very similar one. Um, some lovely things there, a Ganoderma, little spider that was sitting on the Ganoderma, you'll see him there. Um, we haven't got an ID on the spider yet, but we'll get one. Um, it's great to take our blinkers off. Now, this is the second collection. Now this one's different, we th I think, but to the layman's eye, you would probably say they were the same thing. Now, two meters apart on different logs, pretty much the same looking fungus, bright yellow, same length and shape. You would think they're the same things, but what you will notice about this one is it has kind of different behavior gills and they have a slight pinkish hue. Now, when I dried these specimens, these ones, the pink really came out. Unfortunately, neither of them through a spore print, but that one is definitely different to that one. Definitely different. Now, th that's what I thought. I thought the same, but the dried specimens, and the thing is we had a group of morphologies here, and we have a group of morphologies here. Now, these have the different gills. These have the short, medium, long, short, medium, long. And do these have, no, and these don't. Now these have kind of different behavior gills, I would suggest. So the only way to just, and this one has much pinker gills. Now when I dried them, those gills went really pink and the other ones remained crisp white. And again, we have a variety of morphologies. So I would suggest they are different, but you'd swear in the field they were the same thing. So interesting. And that was some um, lovely Sterium Austria. Um, which is the leather we see in the field. Beautiful when wet goes lovely orange color. Some lovely little fungi that we didn't collect because that's all they were. Um, great morphology, uh, but not enough for scientific scrutiny, unfortunately. Beautiful looking things. Maybe a Mycena, not sure. Um, that was uh, probably what I would call Leucocoprinus and the white form, not the yellow one you normally find in your house pot plants. So that was very interesting and had some lovely gutation, which made it very photographic. We found beautiful geastrums and those big kind of size of the palm of your hand geastrums that have all that cracking, I would normally associate with uh, geastrum triplex. So that's kind of where I would take those. Um, didn't make a collection of those. 
I guess, capacity to. We didn't have, have the capacity to collect everything we saw. Unfortunately, we saw Fabulacea colostra, which is the, the, the invasive weed species. Beautiful thing to look at, um, but terrible. And the good thing to see was uh, that it's being attacked by something. So all things are fair. All is fair in love and war, I guess. So they're coming in and taking over, but they're also under attack. But they are really beautiful, aren't they? So you can see why people go to great pains to take detailed photographs of them and go, oh, look what I found. But it's heartbreaking to see this because they really do prevent other fungi from moving in. So again, more geastrums. Maybe this is not triplex, but some really lovely stuff. This is probably what I would call Campanella, maybe Campanella olivaceo nigripes. And the reason I would call that olivaceo nigripes is you get that olive black color towards the center there. Uh, beautiful species to photograph though, really photographic. And this is Mycinaliana varastralis, and uh, really great one. So uh, one of the young uh, girls was there with the parents that day. She, she found this one, so she was thrilled. Um, what was her name, Judith? Evie, so Evie found these, and we we're really thrilled that she did because they're a beautiful specimen. So we identified them to species in the field, so we didn't make a collection. We just took some photographs and uh, and moved along. So that was a great a great find. And uh, little bugs. So Vivian was very thrilled. We found some good bugs on the day. Some of them were in our skin by the end of it, but nevertheless, we found some that were in fungi. So our Mycito Biont studier. Uh, Insect studier is is very happy that we found these little little fungi uh, and a little so I believe some work. Sorry. Some yeah. So she was saying that the, the job now for her is to keep them alive and to rear them to adulthood. So of course Vivian has the appropriate permits for collecting insects in the field. Uh, whereas we collect the permits of fungi. So it's great to have her on board and she collects all the stuff we leave behind that's full of insects and does all that tedious work really then to adulthood to find out more about what's going on there. This was interesting and I would have no idea where to begin to put this, this tiny little white fungus. Judith and I saw this recently uh, up the coast, but we only found like two or three fruiting bodies. And as you can see, they're so tiny, but at least on, on that day, we were able to make a really good collection of it. And uh, they are beautiful, but really tiny. They are gilled and really tiny little white fungi. As you can see, each one's only about three to four millimeters across at adulthood, maybe five millimeters, if it's a really big one. Um, and of course, we found Myxomycetes. Um, so I would call this Hematrichia circular. Again, I believe microscopy is required, but I, I, I would, it's a slime mold. Um, which is really interesting. So slime moles used to be called fungi, but they're not anymore. So really interesting in the kingdom of life because slime molds are actually single-celled organisms that come together collaboratively and also display multicellular behavior. So there's a suggestion that they are the living example of a surge towards multicellularism. Um, so really interesting that we live in a time where we can observe a kingdom of organisms that is actively trying to become multicellular. And that's what slime molds are, so they're fascinating. Um, and that's in its plasmodial stage, so just prior to becoming sp sporulating. All right, so uh, that was about it for the day. So thank you, everyone. I'll stop sharing. And uh, thank you, everyone online. And um, I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, stop the recording and uh,